Hello everybody, I am Suresh Kumar, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English, St. Jesus College of Arts and Science, Kadalu. Today, let's discuss Alan Tate's Tension in Poetry. Let's have now a brief introduction about the author Alan Tate. John Orley Allen Tate was born on 19th November 1899. He is known professionally as Allen Tate and is an American poet, essayist, social commentator and poet laureate from 1943 to 1944. His genre was poetry and literary criticism. His literary movement was new criticism. His notable works are Word to the Confederate Death. Let's analyze now Tension in Poetry by Alan Tate. He was a poet, teacher, novelist, and a leading exponent of new criticism. He was one of the youngest new critics who belonged to the southern group of American critics. Tate gives importance to the formal qualities of a work of art. Reactionary essays on poetry, ideas, and reason in madness are his well known collections of essays and reviews. As a new critic, Tate has coined the term tension to describe what he calls the common quality of good poetry. Tension in poetry is taken from Tate's the man of letters in the modern world, selected essays. The essay deals with tension as a life of a poem. It reveals Tate's view that a good poem is one in which the extension and the intention are in a state of tension. It's a combination of both extensive or denotative or intensive or quantitative meanings. This essay has three parts. Part 1 deals with the fallacy of communication in poetry. Part 2 defines tension in poetry and explains its importance. And part 3 gives the final example of the significance of tension. But now let us look it into part 1, that is fallacy of communication. Mass language, says Tate, is a medium of communication. Tate illustrates the point with some examples. The first example is Justice Denied in Massachusetts, a poem by Miss Miller. The poem received much attention at its publication in 1957. But Tate says that the poem did not clarify how the judicial execution of two migrants, Sacco and Van City, has something to do with the plotting of crops and the general aridness in Massachusetts. The poem is an example of the fallacy of communication in poetry because it is obscure. The poem makes sense only for those who share the feelings of the poet or her contemporaries. Another example of obscurity is found in the poem The Wine by James Thompson. The language here appeals to an affected emotional state. It does not have a coherent, literal or implied meaning. The more closely one examines the lyric, the more obscure it becomes. The imagery does not add anything to the general idea of the poem. Another example is Cowley's theme to light. Tate says that both poems are failures. The wine is a failure in connotation. The wine is a failure in connotation. The language of the poem lacks objective content. Take music and sound. The content does not allow us to apprehend the terms in extension. There is no reference to objects that we may distinguish as music and sound. According to Tate, 
we can even revert the idea and say that the wine of love is a song and the feast of love is music. Nothing will change. Thus the poem is meaningless. Him to like is a failure of connotation because the connotations of violent, swaddling bands and like represent by the pronoun love give us a group of images. We can appreciate them only if we forget the negative meanings of the things. The poet uses violet, diapers and light without referring to the negative aspects of love. The group will become unified if we forget the negative meanings of them. Then calls this poem absurd because good poetry is a unity of all the meanings from the furthest extremes of intention and extension. The readers' recognition of the action of this unified being is a gift of experience, culture and humanism. The powers of discrimination here are not negative powers but total human powers. They apply to poetry, a single experience of the media. Thus, these kinds of poetry suffer from the fallacy of communication. Now we go to the part 2, which defines the term and explains its importance. Now let me define tension in poetry. There has invented the term, the chopping of the prefixes in and ex from intention and extension. Extension refers to extensive or logical or denotative meaning in poetry. On the other hand, intention refers to the intensive or connotative meaning of poetry. The successive poem is one in which these two meanings are in state of tension. They asserts that it is the life of the poem. They says that the meaning selected by the readers vary according to personal interest. The selection is always between the extremes of intention and extension. The platonist will tend to stay very close to the extension end. He may decide that Marvel's to his stress recommends immortal behavior to young men. It is, of course, one true meaning of the poem. However, the full tension of poem will not allow the readers to entertain it exclusively. The poem has an intensive meaning too. These meanings are sensually extensive and asceticism or spiritually intensive. Then take this other example. He quotes from Dan's Lovely, a valediction for bidding poem. Take quotes the lines which contain the gold conceit. Here, the poet compares the souls of the lovers and their unity with the uniqueness of gold. The soul is non-special. The poet uses a special image, that of gold, to contradict it. However, the denotation of the gold contains the full meaning of the passage. Extension and intention are one here and in each other. Take these as many other examples from the metaphysical symbolist and Shakespeare to prove his point. He says that these lines can be used as touchstones in the Arnoldian sense. Now, in part 3, it gives the final example of the significance of tension. In the third part of his essay, Tate takes a tessert from the divine comedy. The tessert from Inferno provides an excellent, excellent example of tension. The context, Paolo and Francisca were illicit lovers. Dante meets them in the second circle of hell. They are whirling in a high wind. The wind is a symbol of lust. When Francisca speaks to the poet, the wind dies down. She tells him that she was born. The town where I was born sits on the shore. Whither the pro 
decides to be at peace together with the strange that followed him. Here, the literal meaning is that she was born in a town on the seashore. Here, the river port falls along with the tributaries. But the metaphor is more than just the description of the place. Dante pictures the streams of the river as chasing the port out to the sea. Francesca has told Dante where she lives using lucid language, but she has told him more than that. She fuses herself to the river port where she was born. We see the perceived river as Francesca in hell. Tributaries pursue the river. Similarly, lovers follow Francisca, lust symbolized as being also. The, trib the tributaries that pursue a river become one with the river as they flow into it. Similarly, Francesca has become one with her lovers, her lust. She has become absorbed by the sin of lust. She becomes a sin. In the inferno, the damned are incarnations of their sins. The wind of lust is an image. It is a visual as well as, as, well as an auditory image. Francesca is heard by the poet when the hissing sound of the wind dies down. After the wind abates, we hear the cessation continuous whispering sound of the descending pool. Thus we see and hear the sin. Both intention and extension become one. Kate Poole's these lines are supreme example of tension in poetry. Thank you.